Genesis chapter 3, we're kind of moving on our way out of dealing with the curse that God gave to mankind. Uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 17, he said unto Adam, he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. And thou shalt cast, uh, or thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken. And for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. If you look in verse 21... Uh, the Bible says, and, and we are going to get uh, hopefully into this, uh, and unto Adam um, also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. We covered that. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand, take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flame sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. And we understand that from that point forward, God was going to forbid man having access to the tree of life but there are conditions upon which man can have access to the tree of life. And we'll get to that here in a little bit. But let's go to the Lord and pray. And we'll finish out all these uh, wonderful things the Bible has about thorns and thorns in our life and so on. And we'll move into that and maybe, maybe get into a little bit of Genesis chapter 4 tonight. But let's go to the Lord in prayer. And I appreciate you coming. Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight. And Father, I, I want to thank you, Lord, for those that have gathered here with us uh, this afternoon. They are a blessing to us. And I want to thank you, Lord, for those that gather with us online. They also are a blessing. And all of those who listen to this message uh, after it's posted online. And Father, we want it to go forth to wherever you would send it. Maybe through something that is said tonight, Father, somebody's heart, their life would be changed. Somebody's mind would be made up. They're going to follow you. Or they're going to alter their, their thinking about the Bible or their faith or something will happen, God. You'll use the message tonight in some way to help somebody, Lord. I believe that because your word never goes out void. It goes out, you send it forth, it always does what you send it out forth for. And it never returns to you void. It does what it's supposed to do. This is the word of God that lives and abides in us. So Father, thank you for the conversations I've had today on the phone. I pray, Lord, that you'd bless the young lady that called. I pray, dear God, that you would fill her with faith and trust in this book. Father, for those that uh, are hurting, those who are in the hospital, those who need uh, your help, I pray, God, that you'd bless them. We've had many prayer requests come in. And Father, I pray, dear God, for our family. Father, the things that have happened, I pray, dear God, that you would help us. God, that you would supply all the things, God, that we lack and all the things that we need. God, that you would be with us and guide us and help us through these days. We love you and we thank you and we thank you for your word. We ask your blessings on it, Father, in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Uh, turn to the book of Isaiah, chapter 34. In Isaiah chapter 5, we, we left off dealing with that, uh, that song that God sang about planting the, the fruitful hill and he planted the best vine, he picked the best place to, the best ground to plant it in, he planted the best vine, 
but all that came up was something that was corrupt. And it's a picture of Israel. You know, he give Israel all these good things. And it could very well be a picture of churches all over the world where God gives them his good word. And yet they still turn out corrupt. And it can be applied to the Jews, it can be applied to us, it can be applied to individuals. Where God works His work, He gives them His word, He does whatever He does in their life, He does everything He can in their life to supply good things for their life. But the thorns choke out the word of those people's lives. And God says, what more could I have done for that person? So in Isaiah 34, verse 2, He said, For the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations. Indignation means God is angry. He's furious upon all nations and his fury. See, there it is. He's explaining indignation. His fury is upon all their armies. He hath utterly destroyed them. He hath delivered them to the slaughter. And look at verse 13 now. But the cormorant and the bittern, these are birds. And... From what I can see in Scripture, anytime you see birds in the Bible, you think angels or spirits. And cormorants and bitterns, a bittern is a tern, T-E-R-N, and they eat flesh. Therefore, they would be on the list of unclean birds. God said they're not clean. They're, and so you're getting this idea that they're evil. The cormorant and the bittern shall possess it. The owl also. But do owls eat uh, grass? Do they eat seeds? Do they eat berries? What do owls eat? Flesh. They eat rats and mice. And, okay. Ravens. Do they pick berries off of trees? Do they eat seeds? No, ravens eat flesh. All these things are flesh eaters. These are evil devils. Look at what God's saying. The cormorant, the bittern shall possess it. The owl also and the raven shall dwell in it. Four things. Four different types of, of creatures. And you have principalities, powers, and rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places. And he said, and he shall stretch out upon it the line of confusion and the stones of emptiness. Because there's some spirits that whenever they're there, there's always confusion. And I'm, I'm going to tell you about a phone call I, that I received today. And I'm glad I did. Young lady said that she had been following me since she'd been nine years old since she'd been listening to our videos. She said her mom and dad have two. She said the only problem is that her mom and dad has turned over to believing what's called preterism. Preterism says that everything in the Bible has already been fulfilled, including the second coming. So basically, when they read the Bible, they don't believe the Bible. So what's happened, she called me and I said... Young lady, I said, I, I, I believe God had you call me and I picked up the phone for a reason. I'm going to tell you, let God be true and every man a liar. And I said, if you've been listening to me since you were nine years old, you listen to me now. That Bible is right in everything that it says. But what's happened in her family is line of confusion, stones of emptiness. Because... If everything in the Bible is fulfilled, what do we have left to look forward to? Nothing. But, and so verse uh, 12, But they shall call the nobles thereof to the kingdom, but none shall be there. And all her princes shall be nothing. And thorns shall come up in her palaces. And, and I believe, remember what we looked at last week? Thorns, I believe, are devils. So you have cormorants and bitterns and owls and ravens. Those are devils. And now you have thorns. Those are devils. 
Thorns shall come up in her palaces, nettles and brambles in the fortresses thereof, and it shall be an habitation of dragons and a court for owls. Now you have dragons here. And we know what we're dealing with when we're dealing with dragons. We know that we're dealing with Satan. So here's what happens in a person's life. Stones of emptiness enter in. Lines of confusion come in. Cormorants, bitterns, owls, and ravens. These are spirits that move in because somebody is disobedient to God. And God sends them stones of confusion and they read the bible and they say i don't believe this i don't believe that or i think that's a metaphor i don't think well god said that but i don't think he really meant it and that's what that young lady told me that her parents said yeah i know the bible says it but it doesn't really mean that and i'm going if the bible says it i asked her i said if if your parents really believe in preterism that everything has happened I said, my question is, at what day was the sun darkened and the moon turned to blood and the stars of heaven fell? When did that take place? And she said that she asked them that and they said, that's a metaphor. You know what that means? That, you know what that answer means? We don't believe God was saying it the right way. We don't believe what God said in his word. And that's what happens. And families, Christians, and churches have to keep planting the seed of the Word of God everywhere and deal with stuff like this all the time. Amen? We're dealing with it now. We are dealing with it now. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 4. Mm. Brother Sterling, what does the word fallow mean? Fallow ground? Unplowed. See, you know that because you grew up on a farm, didn't you? Okay. And you can't just go out and plant cotton seed in unplowed ground, can you? Won't work. Do what? Got to have room for the roots to get down in there. If that ground has not been plowed up, that seed doesn't stand a chance. So Jeremiah 4 verse 3. For thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground and sow not among thorns. And that right there is the two types of people that Jesus was referring to in the parable of the seed and the sower. Some fell upon stony ground, some fell among thorns. And God said, Break up the fallow ground and sow not among thorns. Listen to me. Plows, when, when, when people plow, you know what they plow? Stripes. They plow in rows, don't they? And every now and then, see this goes along with what I was preaching this morning about, about um, chastening. Sometimes God has to plow up and break up the fallow ground of your heart and your mind in order for the seed to have a chance to take root and to grow in. So what, so some, what, what he's saying is sometimes life is going to have to be hard. Because God is going to take the sword... Beat it into a plow share and plow up the hardness of our hearts so that he can sow the seed of the word of God in our minds and our hearts. Does that make sense to everybody? There's some things that we say, I don't care what the Bible says, I'm not going to do it this way. That's fallow ground. 
And you have to ask yourself the question, is that worth dying and going to hell over? And the answer to me is no. God, break up my fallow ground. God, break it up. Break up. You plow up whatever you need to plow up in my life. I don't want it. And so not among thorns. Then Jeremiah chapter 12, if you would turn there very quickly, just a few places over. Mm -mm -mm. Look at this. Guys, I have to take this Bible seriously. And there are things that I have to say that I may not want to say. Because it'll make people mad. But Jeremiah 12 verse 10, God said, Many pastors have destroyed my vineyard. They have trodden my portion underfoot. They have made my pleasant portion a desolate wilderness. Who did that? The pastors did. They have made it, verse 11, they have made it desolate and being desolate, it mourneth unto me. The whole land is made desolate because no man layeth it to heart. Verse 12, the spoilers are come upon all high places through the wilderness for the sword of the Lord shall devour from the one end of the land, even to the other end of the land, no flesh shall, shall have peace. They have sown wheat, but shall reap thorns. They have put themselves to pain, but shall not profit, and they shall be ashamed of your revenues, because the fierce anger of the Lord. And this is the promise that God made to Adam. It's the same thing that he said to Adam. It's the same thing that he says to us pastors. You'll plow. You'll sow. But sometimes all you're going to get is thorns. And for the pastors, the good guys, it breaks their heart. I'm not the only one. That gets lied about or people leave their church or people stir up trouble against the pastor. I'm not the only one that's ever happened to. I could tell you story after story after story after story. But sometimes the pastors destroy. And it's because in actuality, instead of sowing wheat... They themselves sowed thorns because they sowed words that were not the words of God. And they sowed those words. And what does the Bible say about that? Be not deceived in your mind whatsoever thou sowest, thou shalt also reap. Ezekiel chapter 2. Ezekiel, bless his heart, he had a, he had a rough, he had a rough ministry. God said, Ezekiel, I'm not going to send you to some people whose language you don't understand. I'm not going to send you to a foreign country. I'm going to send you to your own people, Ezekiel. And Ezekiel I can't guarantee you that the words that I put in your mouth and what you start preaching, I can't guarantee you that you're going to be successful in what I sent you out to do. I, I, can't, I can't guarantee you that you're going to have people come to your church. I can't guarantee you that you're going to get people saved. I can't guarantee you that people are going to listen to you because you're, they're going to hear you. But they're not going to believe a word you said. And this is what God is telling Ezekiel. So look at Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 6. And thou, son of man, be not afraid of them. Neither be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns be with thee. Now I'm telling you. I've told you before, and I'm telling you again. As your pastor, I have thorns. 
and you want me to. You don't want a pastor who doesn't have to fight off his own personal battles, his own personal devils, because then I will magnify myself above everybody else and I will treat you people like dirt. And I don't want to do that. See, I consider everybody, this side, this side of the church, I consider everybody here equal with me. I'm not any better. I'm not any worse. So I do have to deal with my own thorns. Messengers of Satan that buffet me. I deal with that. So son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns be with thee. Though thou dost dwell among scorpions, be not afraid of their words, neither, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. And if you look before that, what is that, Ezekiel 2, 6? If you look before that, in verse uh, 2, he said unto me, Son of man, stand upon thy feet, and I will speak unto thee. In verse 2, the Spirit entered into me when he spake into me, and he set me upon my feet that I heard him that spake unto me. See, that God sent his Spirit into him. And then in chapter 3 of verse, uh, chapter 3, look at that. Moreover, verse 1, Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, eat that thou findest. Eat this roll and go speak unto the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he caused me to eat the roll. And what was on the roll was the words that God wanted him to say. And so Ezekiel ate that roll so that the words that he spoke to the people of Israel were not the words of Ezekiel. They were the words of God. That way... When the people heard it and they either accepted it or rejected it, they were not accepting or, reject, uh, accepting or rejecting Ezekiel. They were accepting or rejecting God himself. Which is, I mean, this is why I like to do nothing but give you Bible verse after Bible verse after Bible verse after Bible verse. I put them on the screen. I ask you to turn there in your Bibles, whether I do it here or I do it Sunday morning or I'm doing it upstairs on Pastor Mike online or I'm doing it on a Watchman broadcast. By the way, there's another Watchman broadcast coming out today. It's uploading now. Okay. No matter what I do, I am giving you verse after verse after verse after verse after verse. Though thorns and briars dwell with me, I'm giving those things to you. So that if it has an effect in your life and it helps you, then the glory belongs to God. And if it happens out that you reject that, you're not rejecting me. You're rejecting the word of God. Amen. Uh, Matthew, turn there. Now, let's see here. Where do I, I already? We did that last Sunday, right? We, and we did that last Sunday. Turn to John chapter 19. Let's let's finish this part out. John chapter 19. I love this. Mm, 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 mm. John chapter 19. This is the story of Jesus when he goes to the cross. What is he? Remember? Okay, so think about it. We go from Adam, the first Adam, to the second Adam. The first Adam gets cursed with thorns. Second Adam takes the curse to the cross with him. And kills it so that the curse then is no more. So look at John chapter 19 verse 1. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. What does that mean? Scourged him. What does it mean? Huh? They took a whip. Some say it's a cat of nine tails. I don't know. The Bible doesn't say it. It was a scourge of some kind. 
And I'm sure it wasn't pleasant. But Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers platted. And what that word literally means is they took the, the sticks off of a tree where, that had all these thorns. They took the sticks and they wove them together. And it literally looked like DNA. It literally looked like DNA. When they platted it, that's what they made it look like. They platted a crown of thorns. They twisted it together so it would hold together. And they took that and they beat that on his head. And put it on his head and they put on him a purple robe. And they said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto him, Behold, I bring him forth to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate saith unto him, Behold the man. And Hebrews 6, and we read this last week, didn't we? He that which beareth thorns and briars has rejected it, and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. So here's what Jesus did. He took the curse of the thorns on his head, took it to his cross, had it nailed to his cross, so that you and I, when we die, we get victory over our thorns. Somebody say amen, because that makes me really happy. But I know that as long as I'm alive here on this earth, I'm going to have to I'm going to have to deal with thorns. As long as I'm alive on this earth, I'm going to have to deal with my thorns. But I know Christ will give me the victory over them. Whew, somebody say amen. Now let's go back to Genesis 3. Genesis 3, verse 22. Man's getting kicked out. He's getting expelled. He did what God told him not to do, so... And, and, and think about this. Every day that Adam lived, we don't, and we don't even know, we have no idea how long Adam lived in the Garden of Eden. We have no idea. We don't know if it was a month, a year, a hundred years. We, we, we don't know. We just know that every day Adam could go to the tree of life and whatever fruit that was on the tree of life, I, I would say it's a pear because I like pears. I like pears. So I think the, the tree, the fruit on the tree of life was a pear. So he would go and he would eat it. Oh. Okay. And I think the plan would have been that as long as Adam had access to the tree of life, if he would eat that fruit every day, he would live and there would be no death to him whatsoever. Wouldn't that be cool? But because he disobeyed God. He can't be a sinner. And live forever. Now. How many Watchmen broadcast, Pastor Mike online, things, whatever that some of you have seen of me. Where I've talked about how guys like Ray Kurzweil and others want to try to tell us that there's coming a time when man will live forever. You shook your head. Okay? I talk about that. Because every time they release something out on the news, in, on the internet news, about some breakthrough with DNA, some breakthrough with technology, some breakthrough with linking the human mind. I'm, so think about this. You know, Ron and Sandy, are the, they're the weirdos in our church. They don't have internet. They don't have internet. Huh? Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. You got it in your house. That little black box where you got your phone. 
You got internet. Okay? You got it. They don't. Okay? But at some point, Ron and Sandy, mandatory. Because they will have a way of linking the human mind with the world wide web. It is communism in its most ultimate form. See, Hyunmi knows a little bit about North Korea. North Korea, as far as I'm concerned, is the worst country in the whole world. Because it is an absolute, absolute totalitarian government. Am I right? The Kim family rules everybody and but there are there are people who think differently in North Korea they don't say it out loud but they think different so Kim the Kim family thinks that they have totalitarian rule over everybody but the truth of it is they really don't Three generations, that's right. So, once everybody gets linked in to the net, then you will have absolute totalitarian communism. Everybody will be forced to think the exact same way and everybody will be linked together right so and and eventually they will figure out a way to download your consciousness into a machine so that you don't need this body anymore you will live forever in a machine, you'll live forever. Perfect world. God says, I gotta, I've got to expel him. So look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 22. The Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So that if Adam or any of his offspring ever tried to approach the tree of life, there was a sword there to stop them. No, you can't have this. You cannot have this. You're going to have to die. Now, the tree of life. I, I, lo I love this. Because... One of these days, God is going to give us access to the tree of life. God's going to give us access. Where is it, by the way? Proverbs 3. Turn there. Proverbs 3. I love the Bible. I love teaching the Bible. I love talking about the Bible. I love reading Bible verses out loud to you. I love telling you what little, what little bit my little bitty brain knows about the Bible. I love doing this. I really am. I'm still thinking about a 24-hour preaching marathon. I'm still thinking about it. Okay? My wife's looking at me going... I, I wouldn't make I wouldn't make y'all sit here. But a twenty four hour live stream preaching marathon. Why not? Why not? I got enough Bible to do what? Huh? That's right, I reach all the time zones. I mean I got I got a I got a whole Bible full of stuff to preach on. I, I would never run out of subject material. Proverbs 3, verse 13. 
Happy is the man that findeth wisdom and the man that getteth understanding. How many of y'all know that? Say amen. For the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver and the gain thereof than fine gold. And I can tell you that the things that God has given me, the things that he's blessed me with, it's far better than what I originally, when I originally became the pastor of this church, I, and I've made this very clear, I've been very honest. What I wanted was to build sort of like this little mega church and have all these people in here and everybody like me so that I could get more money. I was being honest. And God whipped me hard over that. And then God in his goodness said, Mike, I got, a, I got a different plan for you. I'm going to teach you this Bible. I'm going to give you things. And you know what? I found more happiness in that than if you were to give me a million dollars. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom and the man that getteth understanding for the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver and the gain thereof than of fine gold. She is more precious than rubies and all the things thou canst desire not to be compared unto her. Now, let me tell you, when it says she, let me tell you what I do. Before I make any kind of major decision, I talk to my wife. Talk to my wife. Because God has given her a wisdom that I don't have. And sometimes an understanding and an outlook that I have never thought of before. And I'll talk to my wife before I do or say anything. A lot of times she'll say something and I'll go, you know what, I never, you're right, I never thought about it that way, but you're right. Now that doesn't mean that my wife controls me, it doesn't mean that my wife puts her foot down and says, this is it's my way or the highway, it doesn't mean that at all. We have a relationship and a friendship that's built on trust where she knows that I'm going to go to her or that she can come to me and counsel me and tell me things. This Bible's right when it says she. Husbands. Listen to your wives every now and then. Um, let's see here. She is more precious than rubies and all the things thou canst desire to be compared unto her. Length of days is in her right hand. And in her left hand riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life. Now ultimately this is talking about heaven. When the Bible talks about she, in, especially in the book of Proverbs, it's referring to heaven. Because Jerusalem above is the mother of us all. So her ways are pleasantness and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her and happy is every one that retaineth her. The Lord by wisdom hath founded the earth by understanding hath he established the heavens by his knowledge. The depths are broken up and the clouds drop down the dew. And, and what he says there in verse 20, he says back in, I think it's in Deuteronomy where he said, my doctrine shall distill as the dew, like the gentle rain. So it's just like when rain comes down, when, do, when God's doctrine comes down, when his word comes down to us from heaven while we're reading our Bible, that's like gentle rain upon the seed that he just sowed. So that as God waters us, we increase. Now, turn to Proverbs 11. We're looking at the tree of life. One of these days, we're going to get access to it. 
Proverbs 11, verse 30, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. Now, who is the righteous? Jesus. He's the only one. And his fruit are, go to um, Galatians. Go to Galatians chapter 5. Look at his fruit. You know what his fruit are? Galatians chapter 5, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. That's the fruit of the righteous. That's what Jesus has with him. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. And he that winneth souls is wise. Behold, the righteous shall be recompensed in the earth, much more the wicked and the sinner. The righteous, listen. The things that we think we've lost. I promise God will give back better than he ever has. Did he not do that with Job? Absolutely. Absolutely. Turn to Proverbs 13. Proverbs 13. Shouldn't take you very long. Verse 12. Hope deferred maketh the heart sick, doesn't it? See, we have hope that our prayers will get answered. And while we're waiting, our heart is sick. But when the desire cometh, it is what? The tree of life. Now, my biggest hope, my ultimate hope, is that I want to go to heaven when I die. That's my ultimate hope. I want to go to heaven when I die. But hope deferred maketh my heart sick. There are days. I'm not kidding you. I'm not kidding you. There are days I'm going, I hope I get killed in a car wreck. I want to go to heaven. But when the desire cometh, it is the tree of life. And the tree of life is up there. Whoso despiseth the word shall be destroyed, but he that feareth the commandment shall be rewarded. The law of the wise is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. So it's all about this Bible. You follow this Bible, God will lead you back to that tree of life, which is in heaven. So, Proverbs 15. Verse 4. A wholesome tongue. Who has the wholesome tongue? Jesus. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life. But perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. So Jesus has the wholesome tongue. And his words. Look here. Here's the tree of life. So, Revelation chapter 2. Turn there very quickly because we're almost done. Almost done. You know, when we get to the book of Revelation, there's no more after that. So, God would be almost done. Revelation 2, 7. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Do you see what God did? God made the, the Garden of Eden just like heaven. And up in heaven, in the midst of heaven, is a tree of life. So, in Revelation 22, it's so beautiful. Revelation 22, He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life which bare twelve manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. 
and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. The tree of life is right there at the throne of God, and God is going to give us access to it all we want. Bears 12 manners of fruit, every, a different fruit every month. Banana, I love bananas. Who said that? Did you say that, Cubby? Who else who loves bananas? I love bananas. I love pears. Where's my pear people? I hope it ain't no grapefruit. I hate grapefruit. Okay, but 12 manner of fruit. Maybe it's fruit that we have never even tasted that all of us are going to enjoy. Amen? So let me ask you a question. We've been banished from the tree of life. Won't it be worth it? Whatever we have to endure to get back access to the tree of life. So verse 14, Blessed are they that do His commandments, they, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without our dogs. So I'm sorry but dogs don't go to heaven. And sorcerers. And whoremongers. And murderers. And idolaters. And whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. I Jesus have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things. And the churches I am the root and the offspring of David. And the bright and morning star. Blessed. Back, back at verse 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life. And his commandments are love the Lord your God. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's his commandments. It's to love people. And oh, I want to love people. Amen. I don't want to be bitter. I don't want to be hateful. I want to love people. Because I want access to the tree of life. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I don't know, Lord, if I said anything worth hearing tonight. Father, you just filled my heart with a lot of good things that I needed to hear. Father, the tree of life, I want access to it. And I'm willing, Father, to go through anything, to endure anything, to keep your word and your promise and your hope firm to the end so that I can have access to the tree of life and live forever. Father, bless these people that have heard your word tonight that they also have access to the tree of life. It's up there waiting for us. We have but to endure faithfully unto the end. Help us to do that tonight. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. Thank you for coming. I appreciate it.